on behalf of Indus International Research Foundation, I welcome you all for the IIRF Aerospace and Defense Technology Weekly Lecture Series. As you know, these lectures are especially designed for our audience from the defense industries, SMSEs, startups, and the defense scientist community on whose shoulders lie the burden of taking India on the onerous path of Atmanirbhar Bharat in defense production as well as in defense technology. Through this lecture series, IRF will be trying to bridge the gap between the understanding of India's defense needs and what the private sector can innovate and deliver indigenously or through collaborations. Through this lecture series, it will be our attempt to field prominent high profile speakers, specialists, industry leaders, and speakers representing government of India dealing with the relevant subject that is of your interest. We also intend to invite speakers from the industry who wish to put across their points of view, share their experiences, or highlight their problems and aspirations in their respective areas uh, they are dealing with so that their voice reaches the right quarters. Today's guest speaker is former Director General of the Electronic and Mechanical Engineers, EME, Lieutenant General Dr. Anil Kapoor, AVSM, VSM, who will speak on the topic, Emerging Technology Landscape for Modernization of Armed Forces, a consortium approach. However, before we invite General Dr. Anil Kapoor to deliver his talk, may I request the President IIRF, Brigadier Sandeep Kumar, VSM, to give his welcome address and kick off the lecture series. Over to you, Brigadier Sandeep, sir. Thank you, Raj. Uh, at the outset, let me welcome all the esteemed guests who have spared their valuable time to attend this event on Atmanurbhar Bharat in aerospace and defense industry. Uh, we are today fortunate to have Lieutenant General Vinod Khandare attending this webinar. Welcome, sir, and we request you to give your views at the end of the talk. Uh, we welcome uh, senior office bearers of our partners, USA, General Anand, St. Joe's uh, Research Assistants, and uh, the Strike. We, all, uh, we also, all the esteemed entrepreneurs who spared their time and valuable time because it is for them and the uh, Defense Forces we are organizing this series of uh, talks. It gives me immense pleasure to inform you that Indus International Research Foundation, in collaboration with our American branch, World Trade Center, Utah, the Institute of Chartered Accounts of India, based in Utah, USI, Center of Joint Warfare Studies, uh, Integrated Defense Staff, New Delhi, STRIVE, and the Policy Times have, uh, you know, we are starting a lecture series under the banner Atmanurbhar Bharat in Aerospace and Defense Industry, the way forward for strong and resilient India. The broad aim of the series of lectures is to familiarize the private defense industry and the entrepreneurs with the broad emerging technology needs of the Indian Armed Forces. As you all know, the emergence of disruptive technology and its application in various domains of warfare can revolutionize strategic and operational and tactical concept in security and defense. These revolutionary technologies can not only provide decisive advantage in the battlefield, but also require innovative organizational changes to fully harness their disruptive potential. Uh, it will be of interest, you know, European Defense Agency identifies six particularly disruptive technologies, that is quantum-based technologies, artificial intelligence and robotics, robotics and autonomous weapon systems, big data analytics, hypersonic weapon system and space technologies, and new advanced material as the major game-changing game technologies which will affect the defense, uh, the way the war is fought. The rapid advance in disruptive technology will facilitate in shaping of the war front in all domains of national power of the adversary. There are so many domains available today which will all get affected by the uh, disruptive technology application. As per KPMG studies, India is among the top three nations in disruptive technology development. So that's a very bright thing. And that is where the private defense industry and entrepreneurs play a vital role. Welcome you all to this event and let us work together to achieve 
टोटल आत्मनिर्भरता इन द नेक्स्ट फ्यू इयर्स फर्स्ट ऑनलाइन लेक्चर इन द सीरीज बाय लेफ्टिनेंट जनरल अनिल कपूर अदर विशिष्ट सेवा मॉडल विशिष्ट सेवा मॉडल फॉर्मल डायरेक्टर जनरल ऑफ इलेक्ट्रॉनिक्स एंड मैकेनिकल इंजीनियर्स ऑन इमर्जिंग टेक लैंडस्केप इमर्जिंग टेक्नोलॉजी लैंडस्केप फॉर मॉडर्नाइजेशन ऑफ आर्म फोर्सेस ए कंसोर्टियम अप्रोच विल बी डन टुडे and we will continue with this series in in the uh, in the coming uh, weeks he is a visionary technocrat and is functioning in the advisory role functioning in advisory role in number of iits and is also the chairman of national advisor committee advisory committee of asset management society of india he was awarded eminent engineer award in 2020 by the institution of engineers india i once again welcome you all and hand over to general anil kapoor to uh, conduct his talk thank you thank you sir uh, uh, good afternoon good evening to everybody uh, it's indeed a proud privilege and an honor to be speaking on the lecture series of iirf uh, on a subject which is absolutely contemporary and very close to my heart on emerging technologies landscape for modernization of arm forces and the approach to my mind is always a consortium approach let me start by saying that the new tech world order over the past decade is dominated by four d's data digitization digitalization and disruption and while the first 3 d's have resulted in a global digital transformation and india in any case is iconic by the digital public infrastructure it has created which has become a sterling example globally i think there is a lot more to be done when we talk of this digital footprint in the arm forces modernization process but that said i think where is the importance of technology comes in from the fact that globally we are going through a major geopolitical turmoil if i may use the word the world order is again being defined by what came after the gulf war vuka volatility uncertainty complexity and ambiguity and we see this lately over the last year or two in the way russia ukraine war is panned out and the way israel hamas and the committee of nations around is posturing for military operations creating what is being talked of today as bani which is brittleness anxiousness non linearity and incomprehensibility not only amongst nations but even amongst societies there's brittleness because there's only an illusion of strength nobody ever knew israel would get hit the way it did but it showed the illusion of strength and we can discuss some of this during q and a there's anxiousness because there's a illusion of control actually the control is rather weak there's non linearity because there's illusion of predictability and most of these strategic pundits are going wrong in their predictions because of this non linearity and the whole situation is fairly incomprehensible because of the dynamics with which things are moving in the face of technology in the face of geopolitics and in the illusion of knowledge that everybody feels he knows something but he don't know most and therefore today if we look at technology is the predominant factor is the key figure which counts for national development which counts for national growth which counts for national economy and which accounts for a comprehensive national power and global power projection and therefore the 
topic of emerging technology landscape, I think, is a good start point. Let me start by saying that when we look at emerging technology landscape, we are actually looking at a marathon race. Way back in 1949, we all know that there's a book titled 100 Year Marathon of China. And we have seen in a span of time how the face of China, the visible face of China, has changed many fold. And today, it's in a position of strength when we look at it from a technology perspective. I think we need to look at this as our long term focus not only for modernization of armed forces, but also look at it from the aspect of an Atum Nirbhar Bharat, a technologically sovereign Bharat, where make in India and made in India is a norm. Before I go further, let me come up with a couple of anecdotes and short stories, primarily to bring in the importance we can associate to the changing paradigm in our country today with entrepreneurs, with startups supported by a vibrant government and an equally vibrant industry. The first I'd like to talk about is laser technology. Some time back, when I was in service and located in Northern Command, we had a lot of sniper actions happening on the line of control. And during one of the Nortex, we found that there was a imported equipment called optical target locator. And they also call it, called it a sniper detection system. And we put together a small team of LESTIC DRDO, IIT Delhi, and some of us who evinced interest in the innovation and went about doing the optical target locator. In so doing, what we realized was not one, but we found three good products that we could put together for effective deployment. One was the optical target locator or sniper detection system, which was brilliantly effective. We designed and developed a laser fence and a laser communication system. So sometimes uh, small ideas, well-composed teams, and a good focus of all stakeholders results in big impact. And the uh, power of technology. General Kapoor, sir, uh, so sorry for interruption. Your screen is not moving. In case you want to move the screen, yeah, I'll move you will it. have to do that. I'll move it. I'll move it. Okay. Thank you, sir. You can continue. Right, right. The second is on artificial intelligence. We wanted to create an artificial intelligence platform for satellite imagery interpretation. And we thought a good start point would be to do a kind of a webinar the way we're doing now and look at all the possible stakeholders who would come forward to participate in this program with us. And lo and behold, we got a couple of startups who have huge interest. And one of them, I would not like to name, came up with a kind of a platform. He positioned his GPU with us, which was actually carrying out detection of cancer cells and an early detection at that using his AI software. We use the same AI platform to identify targets of military importance in satellite imagery by, of course, feeding a lot of data and imagery which was required for this detection. And when COVID happened, the same platform was used for management of hospitals, for management of bed, for management of healthcare specialists, and the process of healthcare. And therefore, when we look at artificial intelligence, please don't look at it as a discrete problem solving tool. Artificial intelligence is a platform, and a platform can often offer multiple services. I'll leave this at that for the moment. 
The third one is perhaps interesting and intriguing because when we close the battlefield management system, being a no-go in terms of costs and technology important, we were quite saddled with the problem of finding a good solution. And what we did, we went across to the research design and standard organization of the Indian Railways, who were actually doing a project with Space Application Center ISRO to find visibility and create a management structure, a virtual management structure of all unmanned crossings. That same technology we adapted and adopted on our own blue force tracking successfully. And therefore, what I want to say here is that there is a need for us to look at a national R&D organization. When we are looking at a technology landscape and when we are looking at modernization, let's not look at a DRDO and associated industry. Let's look at it as a whole of nation approach. Let's also savor the power of duality in terms of customization of technology. The same technology was used after the Bombay incident for identifying friend or foe fishing boats. So, so really speaking, when we look at an emerging technology landscape, we are looking at a consortium. And I thought through these examples, I'll try and set the pace for the importance of looking at it holistically and, as I said, a whole of nation approach. So the mission statement which I would like to bring on the table at the start of this series is to design a blueprint for deployment of emerging technologies, deep tech if you may like to call, as a game changer in Atmanirbhar Bharat, Make in India and the armed forces. Now let's do a little mission prognosis. In the red fireball, which is in the center, we have the threat assessment. We talk of a gray zone warfare or hybrid threat, which comprises psychological, propaganda, fake news, water, energy, resources, all of which at a point in time can become triggers for a limited or a full scale war. Add to it the invisible warfare which goes on in terms of space, cyber, electronic warfare, information warfare, or if I may say, disinformation warfare. And then we have the sub conventional threat, which is low intensity conflict, limited military actions through surgical strikes, and we also have some bad actions which we know, posturing drones and others, which are subconventional in nature. And then, of course, conventional conflicts, which we have seen, which have the contours of a short duration to an extremely long drawn war, the way we are saying. And therefore, when we look at India today, we are looking at a huge coastline and therefore the Indian Ocean region, Indo-Pacific, if you may, our exclusive economic zone, the international border, the line of control and line of actual control, and the internal security situation in the CICT. So really speaking, we are a land where all threats of all types, all shapes can manifest, and we have all been privy to most of them. And therefore, when we look at all this, I'm looking at what are the dominant vectors vectors and support vectors which drive capability development. And I've identified four of them. Starting from top right, the first is connectivity. I think the biggest driver with some type back was more defined by hardware and software as the dominant vector with information and other soft being a support vector today as the contours of information being the dominant vector and hardware and software being the support vector. 
the whole dynamics has changed. And when we look at connectivity, what we are looking at from a military perspective is a good ICT network, a cloud infrastructure, data centers, and an ecosystem which will give us real-time situational awareness and a common operating picture by service. The second dominant driver is lethality. And when we look at lethality, we're looking at lethality of information and disinformation, which has already become the dominant. Lethality through stealth or standoff, which is equally important, and firepower. And I'll qualify this uh, subsequently as to how lethality through deep look, deep strike is very important, but more important is accuracy in our firing. We've seen in the Russia-Ukraine war analytics that only 20% of the missiles, 20% of the RT ammunition actually went to the intended location. I think technology today allows you the luxury of hitting the bullseye and we must look at it accordingly. Let's get to the third pillar. The third driver is automation to autonomy. I think there is a space for manual intervention. There's a space for automated information. And there's a space for autonomous operations. And today, autonomy is becoming the dominant vector. And as we look at it, Autonomy is driven by unmanned autonomous systems, which actually transcend to semiconductor and software, the two S's, which are golden when we look at from a perspective of technology. And these in Indonesia today have resulted in a huge disruption in military affairs that we shall see as we move along. And that gets me to the fourth pillar, which is perhaps as predominant and as important, which is sustainability. And when we look at sustainability, in short wars, we all feel that we are well off. But when we look at long drawn conflicts, that's where we have to look at strategic readiness. We have to look at agile integrated logistic support systems. We have to look at our defense industries from bases to the edge, to the tactical battle area. The Gati Shakti there and the surge requirements which were manifest with time. We have to look at an integrated approach to asset management where we have mapping, warehousing and life cycle sustenance support built into the system. And most importantly, we have to look at how to manage legacy with the state of the art. That bridging that gap is equally important and technology today can do it. So with this as the prognosis, I would bring to, to the table what therefore are we looking at from a capability development perspective before we dive into the deep tech. So we're looking at five fronts, the Northern Front, the Western Front, the Indian Ocean region, space, cyber, and internal security. And therefore, there's an importance that has huge importance that is to be given on merging technology and data with strategy and tactics. We're looking at quick mobilization, and this is the biggest challenge we have in the high altitude area. So we have to look at a few of these oxygen farms and other such maneuvers, if I may call them, which can aid acclimatization. We have to look at deep look capabilities with layers of surveillance right from outer space through to ground and maybe underwater. We have to look at deep strike, duly integrated with deep look. And here we look at smart combat systems, unmanned autonomous systems, and manned unmanned technology systems. We look at a digital smart soldier because soldier readiness is a function of his health, his protective posture, and 
uh, how he can operate in a very, very CBRNE kind of a environment. I'm sure all of us know it. More importantly, we have to look at mums here with humans and robo humanoids working together in the future, where maybe robo humanoids and unmanned systems will be the dominant vector and human will be supporting him to create the necessary damage on ground. Stealth and adaptive camouflage is becoming more and more important as we look at transparency, which is happening, and traceability, which is happening. And of course, uh, as an offshoot, we look at Avalanche and HADR as value adds that can happen, especially in areas where they are, wherever they happen. We have to look at net-centric operations, integrated decision support systems, cybertronics, electronic warfare space, and uh, agile matching national logistics ecosystem, Gati Shakti that I alluded to. Getting to the stack now, there are four watchwords which emerging deep stack brings on the table which are helping in a paradigm shift in our dominant and supportive vectors. And these are automation, autonomy, precision, and positioning. Let's look at the tech stack. Uh, and today, what I'm planning to do is, rather than go into the kind of studies that have been done globally on what are the dominant ones, what are the top six or top 10, whether it is Gartner, KPMG, and other. I'm just walking through a disruptive technology stack, an unmanned autonomous system track, and a stack on space tech, because all of that at a point in time will be of value. And like I said, it's a long drawn marathon. Starting with disruptive first, I think the most predominant is geospatial technologies. So important in precision and positioning. Everything today, right from the Google map that we use to any kind of information that you want to gather, whether it is based on COVID times, whether it is based on uh, your NPR, National Population Register, whether it is based on Aadhaar, I think the digital footprint today is geotagged. Every footprint is geotagged, whether it is health, whether it is position, where we are staying, what are we eating, where are we moving. So I think when we look at it from a military perspective, geospatial technologies can actually be the foundation on which our digital military infrastructure must work. The next dominant disruptive stack is big data analytics. And I said, AI as a service platform. Now, AI in isolation brings no value to the table unless you have a huge amount of data. And I would not qualify today of the types of AIs and the waves of AIs, but suffice to say that if you have a high volume, high stream, multitude of data coming through multiple platforms, multiple sensors in various shapes, in various sizes, in various forms. I think AI can bring a lot of sense into that data. And therefore, this is the next dominant military need. And in the same breath, I'd like to add that multi-platform, multi-sensor data fusion must form part of this platform list. Multi-platform, multi-sensor becomes an additive uh, entity and you, you lose sight of information into misinformation. We need augmented reality, virtual reality, sensors, and IoT. This is going to be a very big game changer, not only in our wargaming and simulations, it's a game changer in life cycle sustenance support. And as we move ahead, we'll see how. 
central to all this is semiconductor and therefore today we have to look at chip design being a mainstay and when we look at mill grade we have to look at gallium based uh, or maybe silicon carbide is the only one which competes and what we have to look at is we have to go beyond software on chips to software on platforms because there's a huge miniaturization happening and as we move ahead we'll talk more about it we have to look at quantum technologies quantum radars and sensing quantum computers quantum communications nano and quantum materials and energy and why i say quantum is if this digital disruption has ruled over the last two decades i think the future decades are going to be overrun by quantum tech recently i had gone to mit and i came across uh, i was attending a seminar and they were talking of synthetic quantum materials they were talking of synthetic quantum energizers and when you hear such terms they are music to your ears because these are going to be realities they talked of future future data centers which would be lying in your gardens which will be lying in halls where you put flowers today those same flowers would actually be your data centers so so that's the kind of transition uh, something that was sci-fi to you is a reality when you look at these technologies when they come on the table rare earths there's a huge huge rush because it is indeed a huge defense enabler try service and the sooner we realize the power of all this put together quantum nano rare earth the moment we realize the convergence in technologies i think we will realize the power of deep tech and we'll talk about it separately when we talk of rare earths and their impact and therefore today the complete electronic manufacturing is going at a nano scale and when we look at electronic manufacturing at a nano scale it's a huge huge departure because not only are the sizes becoming small the life cycle sustenance support methods are changing the technology obsolescence and infusion cycles are changing and we have to look at it as a life cycle sustenance support parameter something that i'll allude to later with 5g and various quantum radars photon radars cognitive radars there's a huge shift happening in the em spectrum from 0.5 gigahertz to 40 gigahertz and that's a focus which has to be kept hugely in our minds laser i alluded to an experiment i think laser communication and sensing is the best way forward if we were to get out of the electronic warfare on our communication systems then we have the directed energy weapons which have a huge currency both in terms of microwave based and laser based so this disruptive stack is something that i look at maybe in the next decade can change the shape of things the shape of a tri service engagement and the shape of tri service integration which is so core to our futuristic thinking the next big thing that we have seen happening globally is dependence on unmanned autonomous systems and today if i were to start from maybe outer space downwards we are looking at pseudo satellites which are perched in the low earth orbit for maybe months on end depending on how long you can sustain them giving you pinpointed real time situational awareness we've got high altitude long endurance medium altitude long endurance mini micro the palm top black hornet and its indian adaptations which are coming up today thankfully mini helicopters ornithopters something that is again in the realms of uh, ornithopters in the realms of research it will be flying birds as a flock and you would never be able to discern an actual swarm of eagles from a swarm of ornithopters 
and while swarm technology is taking a, a major seat uh, in terms of uh, what we call is a saturated raid which can happen in a particular area right from various kind of payloads that are carried by the swarm to the kamikaze ones the lethal autonomous weapon system is also gaining huge currency also gaining currency is integration of these aerial systems with ground based systems with sea surface systems and with underwater systems and therefore today when we look at a weapon system on ground we cannot lose sight of this kind of uh, integration that must happen and we look at ether drones uh, i i have a story here to narrate which is uh, you know done by a startup uh, when we shifted some of our afps to the high altitude area there was a problem of seeing beyond the crest and that's when a t third quadcopter was designed by a startup at the nick of time and it was deployed again at the nick of time to make sure that we have real time situational awareness more importantly we could put a variety of payloads for communication and try out various permutation and combination for local mission effectiveness and combat effectiveness so really speaking today every piece on ground must have a unmanned autonomous element which can hook on to the ecosystem of uh, what i'm going to call ahead uh, c7 i2 s2 decision support system but i'll qualify that a little ahead but it has to be a system of systems approach no longer is a tank or a squadron of tank or a combat team a combat team in isolation it's part of a ecosystem a ecosystem of the mission all of which is being monitored centrally uh, through a technology interface then we have adequate numbers for uh, unmanned ships speed boats i think the requirement will be huge and therefore the future is going to be dominant on unmanned systems it already is and therefore manned unmanned technology systems are going to be the norm with unmanned systems being predominant imagine today in the cict grid if you were able to isolate and carry out your cordon and search with a unmanned system which is trained duly supported by manned system and you move in only to mop up success i think it can be a huge huge game change in the cict grid both urban and rural loiter emissions we've already seen their impact i think they are hugely effective in bringing down uh, pin pointed fire with pin pointed accuracy and the counter to all this is also equally important therefore you need integrated detection and interdiction systems now from here let's move on to the next predominant warfare which is there waiting for us in the future the space tech stack we have the space domain awareness and the space situational awareness needs i think space is becoming a hugely contested space and with our own chandrayaan having gone i think we are now among the top 5 in the world who can look at a future space as a home beyond earth and if we can do that we need to develop ourselves for a domain awareness in space what does the outer space look like what is the domain where does the debris lie where does the opportunity lie and situational awareness to see who all are there who all are enemical to our interests identify friend or foe then in any case what will always remain important to us is low earth orbit satellites medium earth orbit satellites and launch on demand satellite systems we also need to look at space based kinetic non kinetic systems which are operative operative from space or from ground we need to look at assets we need to look at 
hypersonic systems, hyperglide vehicles, hypersonic missiles. And while uh, these have a huge military significance, I think in times to come, we'll be traveling by hyperglide from Delhi to New York in two hours. It'll happen. It'll happen maybe in our own lifetimes. And there's a huge, huge amount of work happening in this space. Global navigation system is a satellite system. Our own Navic is creating reverberations. And I think there's a huge, huge value that we'll have as a nation when we get to Navic and a resilient PNT. Uh, we, we know what has been happening in Texas every month. Uh, if you read up, there are a lot of uh, PNT problems, GPS related problems, which result in large number of cancellation or diversion of flights. Why it is happening around Dallas, I'm not too sure, but I've read large number of reports and which is actually thought America thinking on resilient PNT. And today they are putting together a terrestrial system in addition to GPS to make sure that if GPS gets compromised, they are still able to maintain the digital sanctity of themselves. And then, of course, we now move on to outer space for unmanned autonomous systems and unmanned combat autonomous system in a seeker shooter board. All this and a lot more which I could have spoken actually requires a whole of nation approach. This perhaps is the window of deep tech when we look at it from a military perspective and more importantly, from a dual use perspective. Now, let me quickly walk you through because time is at a premium, walk you through a combat vehicle platform as to what do we look at a future ecosystem of weapon platform and combat vehicle, something that I alluded to some time back. Now, today we have these IoTs and smart wireless sensors of all kinds, proximity sensors, pressure sensors, humidity sensors, gyroscopes, accelerometers, optical sensors, light sensors, image sensors, magnetic, and the like. There are an inventory of over a thousand sensors. But the mother of all sensors, which I call uh, for mechanical system, is the torsion vibration sensor. Now, we did an experiment, and I'd like to highlight this experiment to bring home a point that this sensor unobtrusively sat on a flywheel and every minute churns out 6 lakh data points. Every minute. Every revolution was 6 lakh data points worth. And using an AI software and a human machine interface dashboard, we could actually assess the health of the power pack of a tank and bring out greens, ambers, and red. Greens meant don't bother. Ambers meant start thinking you may need to maintain it very soon or replace it or repair it. And red meant you're critical on time. It can fail you any moment. And therefore, in times to come, this is going to be the mainstay of mechanical systems and health monitoring systems when we look at a life cycle sustenance support. Let's look at a future combat vehicle. And since I did not have a combat vehicle to put on this, I put a car with a large variety of sensors all over, right from suspension to the power pack, to the transmission systems, to the driving compartment, to engine compartment, to the uh, fuel tank and everything. So almost uh, 80 to 150 sensors today reside in state-of-the-art cars, all connected by almost a 10-kilometer long cable weighing 50 to 100 kgs with different protocols of different types available for wired harness. Today, this is being replaced by Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. And you have the whole thing, when you look at, into something called uh, electronic control units. And most of us would have heard of it. And when I say ECUs, I call it humanizing an asset. These are the sensors like our body sensors. They are identical. And today, you can put so many of them, whether it is advanced 
driver assistance system, engine control module, electronic brake module, powertrain module, vehicle control module, and there are almost more than 50 of these which actually we set in a vehicle to give you real-time situational awareness and a common operating picture, something that we can do for our assets as well. And in generations of weapon platforms and combat systems to come, there's going to be a software-defined vehicle like we have the software-defined radios. You're going to have central ECUs and zonal ECUs. And they're all going to talk to each other and tell you what the health is going to be like. They're going to have internal connections through Bluetooth and Wi-Fi and external connections through radar processors, safety processors, and gateways. And we'll see shortly how the gateways are going to get structured. And if I were to look at an MBT, like we have shape in the army for ourselves, a typical shape with a system on the tank would be suspension, hull, armament and turret, power pack, and electronics. And everything in the tank that you wanted to know in real time would be available to you, not only to the operators, it will be available to the combat team commanders, combat group commanders, and the sustenance support agencies. The commanders will be very sure of their mission readiness of the combat team, right down to the systems and subsystems in every tank. That is the kind of visibility this will afford. And they're going to be based on wired, wireless, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, SATCOM, and Navic, something that I alluded to in my example, and a T-third communication system. So that's going to be the kind of architecture that we're going to look at in the future. It's going to be a software-oriented, service-oriented architecture. And I'm not going to dwell more on this. Maybe uh, if there are Q&A, we'll talk about it. And to cut the long story short, a space shuttle requires about 1 million lines of code. A stealth aircraft, fighter aircraft, requires about 10 million. A future combat ground system will require almost 200 million lines of code. And that brings the importance of a software-defined system, which is going to be so complex, comprising huge amount of software, huge amount of microcontrollers, and huge amount of electronic control units. And this highlights the importance of semiconductor and software, the importance of rare earth, the importance of gallium-based chips, the importance of software on chips and software on platforms. And now if you look at the four terms of autonomy, automation, precision, and positioning, what are we looking at? We're looking at a connected system, a software-defined tri-service combat system. MUMS duly integrated, a human-machine interface, human to robo-humanoid interface, a robo-humanoid combat force, a combat vehicle to combat vehicle interactions where you're seeing, a combat vehicle to network, a combat vehicle to cloud, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and AI as a service. And therefore, I think the whole paradigm, what we are looking at, through future emerging technology is going to change. And this is how maybe something that is not visible, but actually happening would be known to those who are cognizant of the EM infrastructure and the laser infrastructure and the connectivity and networking infrastructure. Okay, this brings me now to a holistic system for which I often call to command, control, communication, computer, Cybertronics, cognition, and combat decision support system. Now, this platform, I'll come to it a little later. I'd like to say that basically we are looking at three things. We're looking at, if you come to the diagram first, the core is actually open source data, big data, which would comprise all the possible data you'd like to put in, whether it is terrain data, logistic footprint, op deployments, combat surveillance platforms, combat weapon platforms, combat support platforms to help you with blue force tracking, red force tracking. And the with this is going to be like a data lake. You'll have imagery, you'll have text, you'll have your SITRAP information, you'll have audio information, 
you have signal intelligence, you have open source, everything thrown into this data link. And then you have the armed forces information decisions over system, which I call, which will comprise int information system, operational information system, logistic information system, and management information system, because sanctity of data is very important. And all this, when it is put together, it will give you CBI, competitive business intelligence, augmented intelligence to help commanders go beyond what they can foresee, and an artificial intelligence platform. So this is what is going to bring a huge paradigm shift in assisted, augmented, and artificial decision support systems. The next layer would be a communication layer, which would be OFCs, satellite, LEOMIOs, digital troposcatter, 5G, 6G, software-defined radios, YSMS, software-defined networks, network in a box. So this is a layer which is going to maintain your connectivity. And central to the whole thing will be cyber protection, defense in depth, and offensive defense. It has to be built into the system. The data at rest or data in motion has to be encrypted. So a lot of value add is going to happen in this in terms of a large number of industries and a large number of startups which have to get integrated to create this tri-service extravaganza called C7 I2 S2R. And I'll say again, man, control, communication, computer, cybertronics, cognition, which is AI-oriented, and combat which is the end state we want. I stands for information because it contains both misinformation and can fight disinformation. So I2, second is intelligence, actionable information. S2 stands for surveillance and security layer. And of course, reconnaissance, decision support system. So what do we guarantee with this? We guarantee ourselves mission readiness. We guarantee ourselves mission visibility. We guarantee ourselves real-time situational awareness. We guarantee ourselves common operating picture. We guarantee ourselves combat platform readiness, combat support platform readiness, logistic readiness, soldier readiness, info readiness. Can we have a common operating picture for forward line of own troops? Yes, we can. Can we have IFF? Yes, we can. Can we fight misinformation? Yes, we can. And can we fight deliberate disinformation? Yes, we can. So this is going to be the game change for emerging technologies when we look at it from a defense perspective. Right. Coming back to strategic readiness, which was the last one, uh, technology stack, I think, have gone through enough. We look at revamp defense industrial bases. The defense industrial base has to become part of an ecosystem right from the bases where they are today to regional and into the TBA. It has to become the Gati Shakti or the hub and spoke to meet our requirements end to end in ops and otherwise. The op logistics paradigm has to have an Indian Armed Forces Information System which graduates from automation to autonomy and logistics. We'll be talking about this in a subsequent series and we're looking at big data blockchain, which is going to bring the next big change in logistics management, e asset management, robo mules. Heavy lift quadcopters, mini helicopters, which can bring a huge difference in operational environment of uh, tactical battle areas. An autonomous, uh, autonomous power management system. The whole system is going to be power dependent. While electricity today is so important and we provide it by various means, the future electricity is actually artificial intelligence. But that also requires the electricity of today, and therefore you'll need a very well-tuned power management system, which comprises a myriad of power sources. And then central to the whole thing is life cycle sustenance support, because unlike CV Street, defense equipment goes on for at least 40 to 50 years, if not more. And therefore, you need to look at technology obsolescence and technology infusion. You have to look at condition-based monitoring, something that I alluded, which becomes part of your C7 ISR ESS intrinsically and therefore when we look at legacy equipment there's a huge challenge and i think it's a huge opportunity for industry we have to look at smart manufacturing moving forward reclamation technologies 3d printing additive manufacturing and today they are major game changers 
in not only reducing costs, but also beating obsolescence. OK, so if we were to look at a future operational center, it would look at uh, look like what we have in this slide. You'll have all the possible value-added systems that you want to know, and some of them already exist. I wouldn't like to name, but it will be well punctuated on the side with all the abilities and capabilities that you need to enable yourself in peacetime, in limited offensive, in subconventional war, in conventional war, short or long drawn. Uh, and and you have all the possibilities uh, of technologies will actually aid, uh, and I would not like to belabor on all of them, but suffice to say that this is the ecosystem that technological modernization will bring on the table since time is running out. Now I come quickly, uh, sir, may I spend just about 10 minutes more if permitted? Okay, go. Please go ahead. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Uh, now I have come to the consortium. So having seen the technology landscape for modernization, let's look at the consortium. To put all this together, we need to bring structures, strategies, and stakeholders together. So I put together some thoughts on this. The nucleus of this is actually the strategic group, which has to look at it because, like I said, it's a whole of nation approach. You have to look at PMO, and we have a PSA there, and a large number of allied sy systems that he runs, Niti Aayog, ministries. We need to look at cross-functional. I gave you an example of battlefield management system, or cross-functional entities in terms of uh, research, development, and customization can help. We need to create inter-ministerial groups with a technology perspective. High time we start looking at a national R&D perspective a national R&D organization which comprises DRDO, ISRO, all the other R&D organizations, whether it is CSIR and others, and we pick up the heartland of each and bring them together for putting together a common platform or a common picture of future technologies which can be customized for either. Because whatever is true of tri-service will be true of many others. The next layer would be key stakeholders, whether it is defense, armed forces, the design bureaus, the, the industry, the MSMEs, the corporatized ordnance factories, startups. That's the ecosystem that has to come together. And I'll talk about it a little ahead. And then we have to look at the next layer, which is uh, enablers in terms of think tanks, CII, PICI, SHM, and the like. And the last layer, is the movers and shakers who are going to create the infrastructure. We already have a defense industrial corridor and a defense industrial cor corridor coming up. I think all this together has to be looking at kind of a structure which looks at technology as a long term marathon to be curated through a strategy with all stakeholders brought into the hub through various spokes. And, uh, I have, uh, I, mean, I have written something of this in my thesis, which I did in my PhD. But I think it's very important to put a structure before we put anything else looking at the future. And the approach would be, uh, firstly, a tri-service program approach. Let's look at our own Indian Integrated Guided Missile Development Program. And I'd like to allude to this because I've been part of the system way back in 90. This program came up in 84 at the time when India was getting its digital hardware. It came up at a time when technology denial was at its peak. And in 87, MTCR got slapped to put the IGMDP to rest in terms of any kind of parlays that were happening to get technologies either on transfer of technology or on costs. But through a very well-structured mechanism of IGMDP, which comprised a systems technology vertical and a project vertical where they envisioned projects like Prathvi, Agni, Akash, Trishul, and Nag to start with, and many more later, 
I think we curated a brilliant system when our technology was at a low ebb, when we were still in our infancy and crawling. And I think this gives us a huge lesson. There's a need to do a thesis on IGMDP to understand what went right to, for a nation to come together. And I can tell you, academia, industry, all came up thanks to IGMDP. They scaled up. And today we have a robust missile program in India, as robust as ISRO. And all of them are success stories which we need to look at through a program approach. Whatever I've conveyed till now, I think for us in uniform, we need to TAIs, the Infosys, the TCS, the startups, and create a new structure for our TAIization which is technology centric and then look at our program net centric operations and everything tri service nothing per service program on software defined weapon platform so every weapon platform has to be software defined and integrated by design and not by default we look at future systems like this we look at how to integrate legacy into this and that's a huge opportunity like a bra. We look at program unmanned autonomous system, which also look at MUMS, program cybertronics, program condition based monitoring, program war gaming and simulation. And I can go on, but I just thought I'll pick up top six and present it. The next important consortium we require is a national technology strategy. And inbuilt is the defense strategy, technology strategy there and a regulation mechanism to do technology forecasting and technology development through very tight program. It has to be a tight fit program, a lab to market strategy, the way it has been done in America. I mean, that's a great example. Google, Amazon, and Facebook, and others, you name them, they have a, a CV use and they have a military use. And therefore, I think they become multinational today, having started with defense. We talk of DARPA internet, we talk of artificial intelligence with DARPA envisioned in 1950s. So really speaking, we need to have a national technology strategy which brings out very clearly what is our technology forecast 2047. What is the technology vision 2047? We look at a National oh, Technology yeah, Act. Yeah. We look at technology. I know, I know, a webinar. National Technology Day. A national R&D organization. I'll not belabor more. Okay. And I would like to spend maybe a minute on this shaping a future industry with global best practices. So the first need is to humanize all assets. We have to look at human machine interface machine to machine, machine to network, machine to infrastructure, and the like. And this is a great opportunity for MSMEs. It's a great opportunity for startups. China has gone this route. And today they are touted as an AI superpower, a great book written by Kai Fu Li on how they are the superpower by humanizing assets. We have to look at future ready equipment, which is mums. We have to look at managing legacy. We have to look at life cycle and the ROI does not come from production alone. Actually, it comes from ROI. And here I'd like to quote an international study which says that in 2021, the global market for life cycle sustenance support and MRO was $700 billion and India got about $2 billion out of it. By 2030, there's going to be $900 billion. And India, by Niti Aayog reports, is about 10 billion. Look at the delta. Look at the opportunity. I think there is a huge, huge opportunity here. We have to look at the technology innovation engine. In America, they've got something called the engine in MIT. It is worth a study. And they are looking at strategic partnership, joint ventures, all integrated in academia industry partnership. A, a huge synergy. There's a need to adopt technology innovation hubs. 
innovation incubation centers atal incubation centers there are so many of them today there's huge amount of human capital which is getting in here huge amount of, a huge amount of financial capital getting in here and therefore i talked of regulation the way era is a regulation controlling real estate i think we need a national technology act i couldn't deliberate there but maybe another time we would do it if there are time or anything for questions we need to look at industrial automation to industrial autonomy something that is being practiced today in germany and in a big way in the in japan to create capabilities and capacities which have inherent surge abilities we have the industry has to look at a new revamp and therefore we need to revamp the boards of directors to look at technology and data as the new esg to conclude i'd like to say when we look at a deep tech approach its challenges and opportunities galore we have to think try service there's a huge amount of convergence and the true value of integration integration sorry integration will come through c7isr the amazon web services model which binds everything globally in terms of amazon and others all other stakeholders we have to focus on the edge for real time situational awareness common operating picture mission and strategic readiness we have to look at survivability in the cyber th cybertronic threat and war we have to look at sustainability we have to look at traceability transparency and transformation through mechanisms of automation autonomy precision and positioning and last but not the least we need to look at constant innovation and technology infusion these are times of perennial need to innovate and a perennial need to infuse technology and the watchwords are think big act small fail fast recover faster deliver fastest and i think that alone can bring the big change that we are looking at through a consortium approach in our technology modernization in the short and medium and long run jai hind so uh thank you uh, uh general dr anil kapoor for a very very uh, uh future looking uh, talk regarding technology and how it can be uh, brought into uh, the defense structure and uh, uh, the way forward has been very excellently said if we have the intention we can get it done so that is where all the uh, industrial representatives who are here would uh, help us to do it and uh, we are all, already in in the pipeline uh, we are moving forward towards this uh, thank you very much sir and i would now request uh, uh, lieutenant general khandare to uh, uh, to kindly uh, come on uh, we can't see you uh, come and uh, say a few words and his uh, views and opinions on uh, a little introduction as well sir for uh, general khandare okay uh, Lieutenant General uh, Vinod Khandare uh, is uh, is from uh, Gadwal Rifles. He commanded 14 Gadwal Rifles, which did a fantastic job uh, while he was on the line of control uh, during uh, during the Operation Vijay portion, in fact. And uh, then later on, he uh, uh, now currently he is uh, the advisor to the Raksha Mantri. and uh, he is uh, and he has hands on experience of what exactly is happening in the defense ministry so i would uh, request him to kindly say a few words jal uh, khandare sir we can't hear anything what you are talking in case i can see that you are unmuted but we can't hear you uh, maybe sir uh, you could uh, join in again because sometimes the system uh, does go into a, a low on Audio. Okay, now I would request a uh, major Pawan Anand, who who is uh, from the uh, United Services of India, to kindly uh, you know say a few words and his views and opinions on the webinar. 
Yeah, uh, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. And uh, as usual, I think it is an absolute uh, pleasure to listen to General uh, Kapoor. Uh, really an old friend, grown up together with him in the army and uh, senior colleague. And uh, he's really put th things together in such a uh, you know comprehensive way that there's nothing one can really add to what he's talking about in terms of emerging technology landscape. Uh, we are perhaps now looking at um, technologies which are futuristic and we are catching up with technologies which are current. Uh, so I, I think we will, in, in what aims that we have with the in our discussions with the IIRF, we, we will in future probably have to differentiate between what we can do with current technologies and what are the futuristic ones uh, that we need to develop? So uh, maybe the focus can be uh, different and spread out between these two. I, I, it really struck me when he, when he spoke about uh, VUCA and the how the progress of technology is non-linear these days. And therefore, when we do predictive analysis, we actually would go wrong in, in moving uh, sequentially. Uh, so when we look at developing our own systems, we should not look at uh, the broad trends that are there, but we have to leapfrog across trends which are already there. Uh, I think in most of our analysis, uh, we tend to be very technical. Uh, we also need to bring in the 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 uh, marriage between the human factor and the the technology factor that merging of the human and the technology which was also brought out by him i think that gets really high and most of the time when we are uh, looking at technologies most of the time when we are looking at equipment that's where we tend to sometimes go wrong as far as the industry perspective is concerned uh, I think what we are able to bring in today uh, is what the military should be experimenting with straight away and within the military we, we need to be actually looking inwards to see how can we make use of what is already there we haven't even today made use of what is available commercially in India and we keep asking for something that is uh, beyond uh, India. So I think there's a lot of introspection which we need to do within the armed forces and peep into what is already available. There's so much already available, but we tend to look the other way. And that is what sometimes intrigues me because I've been on both sides of the thing. And uh, I'd love to hear what uh, General Khandare has to say uh, on, on these issues as well. So back to you, uh, General Khandare, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, firstly, uh, General Anil, uh, fantastic uh, presentation and you've spoken from the heart that we can make out. Uh, I have very few but specific uh, recommendations. Uh, now, like uh, what uh, Anil was mentioning about certain changes that need to come out. And one of the salient issues which I could hear was TAization, that uh, TA should become the preferred route. Now, uh, if that change has to come up, it has to be initiated by the services because they have to look at how they want to envisage uh, territorial army being employed. Absolutely appropriate to say that 1962 was a separate thing, 1965-71 was separate. But now, to overcome the technology differential between us and China, uh, we need to do something different. I don't think uh, we can wait to get trained while in the army. I think we need to take specialists, and TA is the fastest route. So far, I have not seen this kind of an initiative. So maybe... Uh, the think tank can suggest to the government that this is the change uh, which is envisaged. That is point number one. There are other policy uh, shifts which will also be required because 
Jalan Anil has given a lot of points about integration, cross pollination, being able to educate each other. Uh, now again, cross pollination, giving people on deputation to industry, to DRDO, to R&D organizations is also a policy matter which will have to be initiated by the respective service. Uh, should not be a major problem, but uh, again, initiative has to come from the service. So, a recommendation here so that this kind of a proposal should come up. I will do it on my part also, but I would request that after this session, at least we can do a follow up on this. Uh, the other issue is about whatever number of officers currently are available from the army, say, with DRDO. I think we need to do an audit on whether they are really contributing to technology discovery, technology promotion, or are they on administrative duties? So that part also uh, uh, is something which uh, the primary stakeholder has to initiate. One addition which I want to bring out here, and uh, I would uh, request General Pawan Anand and uh, even General Anil to comment on this. One of the basic pain point with uh, startups and industry is, whether they are MSME or they are big players, is when we make a problem statement from the services, we make it more tactical. Uh, the person who is designing and developing, I'm not even talking about the production house, I'm talking only of the design develop. The designer and the developer is not able to understand when you say uh, the language that we use. He is only interested in what he can understand, what he's learned in the engineering colleges. We have a whole lot of MTechs with us. I think we need to simplify that. I had made a proposal to the Defense Services Staff College that they run the staff course and they also run the TSOC at Pune. I had said that maybe CII can take a one-day capsule in both the places and teach our officers because they are the ones who go into line directorate or staff appointments. All we need is a A4 size one-page problem statement. If you're going to give them tactics, I, I don't think it can work. So uh, we need to get our skills aligned to the requirement. Otherwise, uh, scientists will not be able to do. It happens in Israel because everyone does conscription there. So it's a different story there. But in our country, a scientist or a bureaucrat has not served in uniform. So for them to understand, it, uh, it is a big problem. Uh, the scale of business will happen only when we look at numbers. Uh, the point is, moment we start pr promoting exports, uh, for that we have to be globally competitive in the commercial pricing and in the quality. In most of the cases in our exports, we lose out because after sales support is extremely poor. Uh, case in point is uh, when we gave six uh, ALH to Ecuador. And uh, one after the other, uh, three of them crashed. And uh, we had no way of salvaging the situation. And uh, I think more than a decade, we've not been able to supply anything to Latin America. So it's not just important to sell, because uh, if you're not able to sustain them there, and that is one more uh, thing which General Anil had mentioned about the sustenance. Uh, that somehow gets neglected uh, and we are not able to continue with our deals thereafter. Time taken for decision making is something where, okay, there are two parts of it. DOD where the ministry has its own ecosystem. We are trying to improve there. Uh, but uh, let me be very candid. It's no better in uniform also. Uh, we take a lot of time and I think we all have to apportion that blame. Uh, it will start from uh, the joint director, lieutenant colonel rank, then it will go to a director, DDG, ADG, DG. Then from there, line director, it will go to the deputy chief. There another four or five people. Then they will mark the file to MO for op endorsement. Same process. Then some wise brain will say, sir, it is not your problem. Send it to perspective planning. So there it goes. 
I have seen a file with 19 endorsements and it took two years and it did not pass. So why, why should we look around? I think what we need to do is first introspect in a big way. Other major issues can be handled. My point is let's sort out our own affairs first. And that is where we will be able to come up. Uh, these were a few points which I thought I'll mention. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Jen, uh, Brigadier Sandeep, will you like to take on? Uh, will you like to invite uh, General uh, Arun you, Sani sir. is here? Uh, will you like to say a few words, sir? Thank Arun you, Sani, sir. sir. Uh, General Kapoor has raised his hand. He had some points to uh, say. Let him. Uh... OK. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, sir, uh, I think you brought out some very brilliant points, uh, and I think they're all very relevant. Uh, just since you wanted uh, me to come back on some point, I thought I'll right away come back. So one is on TIization, actually, we moved with the idea. We went to TCS and Infosys, uh, and um, they were very upbeat about it. But like what you said, I don't even know where the file went. We lost the file somewhere in the oblivion because we didn't know beyond the DGIS who would be handling this case to get it clear. But that apart, there is a need for it. Uh, I think they're all very, very willing. And that's, to my mind, the best way forward. We have to look at technology a little differently than what we've been looking at. Bells and others will not be able to help alone. Money alone is not the issue. It is involvement. Uh, you mentioned about GSQR and definitions. Why I normally start with some of these stories is because if you are very clear and take ownership of the issue, you need to have very clear ownership. Then whatever gets correctly defined actually gets precisely defined. In the but if you keep changing the gold post in your definition, neither will it get correctly designed nor will it get correctly developed. And that's been the bane of our system sometimes we have seen it ourselves. And my last point is, sir, uh, that you mentioned about this. Actually, I'm more looking at possible use of veterans. Yeah. Like all of us today, even if we retire at 60, I think we are willing to give our right arm and use our experience to bring forward change, which industry is also looking at. And money is not creating it for us. But our uh, maybe our commitment and our aspiration is to contribute and give back to the society that way. So really speaking, I'm sorry for saying, the way IAS gets inducted into these industries into the boards, they go into the boards very, very easily, get in the ecosystem very easily. It doesn't happen so easily for us in uniform. And therefore, we need to create that ecosystem, maybe through top-down approach, to make sure all of us who are listening and talking here actually also are useful to industry for a meaningful interface. And that's why I talk integrated advisory group, part of an integrated advisory group. So th these are some things you mentioned. Uh, I will definitely come back to you. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. Let's go to the question answers. Question answer. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, uh, there are a few questions in the, uh, in the chat box. We don't have much time left, but uh, we will uh, quickly uh, try to uh, touch some of them. Uh, General Sani, it seems, has left. Uh, uh, there is Mr. Prasad H, who is from the e-plane company, IIT Madras, incubated star startup, who is building India's most compact air taxi. Now, uh, Mr. Prasad H uh, says, good afternoon, sir. Recently, Government of India drafted a policy on deep tech. What is your opinion on this draft national deep tech policy? How does this policy help startups, MSMEs, in supporting? If you can. Good evening, sir. Uh, supporting innovation in defense verticals. Yeah. Kapoor, sir. Yeah, uh, I have gone through this uh, policy on deep tech, but uh, you know, it's, it's firstly a brilliant uh, policy document because for the first time we've had a document which actually spells out what deep tech is and how we would do it. But my bigger point is that 
policy is important, but more important is to create a structure, more important to create a strategy for forecasting and development, more important to create an ecosystem. Now, today we have an ecosystem which I may say is working as islands of excellence. We have, since you're in IIT Chennai, uh, we have technology innovation hubs, we have innovation incubation centers, we got Section 8 companies doing it, we got Atal Innovation Centers, we got Centers of Excellence of DST, we got Headquarter IDS coming up with its own centers, DRDO coming up with their own centers. And this kind of a proliferation results in duplication and triplication of the same effort, both in terms of human capital and finances. So I would look at putting together the whole thing in place actually is not one policy. It's looking at the whole ecosystem, structure, strategy, act. I've talked about a National Technology Act. It's something like, you know, uh, just to bring an example, you know, when the real estate developed in India, there's a real estate policy on which the whole real estate was built. But then, till RERA kicked in, there was enough chaos that happened and we continue to face the wrath of that today, despite 20, 25 years of... Uh, you know, existence and from the time RERA has come, we find a semblance of control, a semblance of regulation. So I would say that it's a brilliant first step, but I think it needs to be looked at holistically to be able to get the bang for the buck that we are looking at. And uh, I can share with you one on one since my coordinates are there, you can get in touch with me and we can talk more about it. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. General Anand, sir, you. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to uh, make a couple of quick points, which uh, General Khandari had also raised, and he asked me to comment on that. So I'll, uh, I totally agree with what he brought out in terms of the pain point. Um, the the kind of problem statement needs a lot of explanation uh, initially. Uh, it can be very simple, and whatever. Uh, discussion that requires to be carried out with the MSME or the developer that needs to be continuously carried out uh, in in a handholding format rather than just trying to put everything in one page and then that thereafter becoming an auditor on what the uh, developer is coming up with. So there's a complete attitudinal change and there's a systemic change that I'm talking about and I totally agree with what uh, Jan Khandare said. I would also like to bring out and uh, to General Khandari if he's still. So the major issue that now comes up is it takes a long processing time within the services. Already, the DAP 2020 is three years old. We are mandated to carry out a review every two years or every three years. We have reached that stage now. If these are the issues that we need to address and make the whole process shorter, this is the time for the right people in the right place to start making the right noises to make it shorter. Otherwise, uh, we will go back to from a 250 page document that we started with with the initial DDP and we landed up now with a 680 page or 800 page document in the DAP and we'll only make it more difficult for ourselves. Uh, I couldn't agree more with General Anil uh, uh, Kapoor that ownership is has to be uh, with the person who takes up the technology development issue within the services. And when we look within, clearly, a one-year tenure or two-year tenure that we, have, that we have been settled with is out of question. I've put it in my recommendations, in, in fact, to the uh, Defense Secretary a long time back, that a person who then once given a project, their rank doesn't matter. If I was given a project as a major, I should have carried on with that project till I was a brigadier. Maybe till I left the service, I should have carried on with that one piece of equipment for the rest of my service, remaining a mentor for that project with the DRDO and with industry. Absolutely. Whereas somehow uh, the services don't recognize that and they keep changing the person. And therefore, when the person keeps changing, you keep having changes in, in, in the requirements that are put up by the services. You keep looking at different requirements from abroad and you make a, a, a real mix up of everything 
and nothing works. So uh, these two, three things I thought I'll just answer out and uh, back to Ranjit Ghosh. I think you had a point. Yeah, Mr. Ranjit Ghosh, uh, please uh, be quick uh, because we have already uh, finished the time. Uh, you can come in. Mr. Ranjit I'm, Ghosh. Uh, May I'm Major Ranjit Ghosh. Uh, huh. Sir, as far as uh, Jan Kapoor is concerned, sir, excellent uh, uh, technology landscape that has come out as far as the emerging technologies is goes. What is missing today, what I hear from all these speakers, uh, as well as the question answer session, is that there is a long term perspective which is required. The entire world is changing as far as the equipment profile is concerned with these emerging technologies. The emerging technologies today are at the basic research level. It is not at the translational level of what the other mature technologies have been. So we have to start thinking today, as you correctly brought out, there is a requirement of a national technology strategy. At this technology, unless you have a strategy, you will not come back into what is the requirement from today onwards. From national to defense, technology strategy will come out which is the basic technologies which we have identified, which has been partly identified by the PSA with those six uh, uh, critical technologies, semiconductors and other things which have come in. Similarly, each of these ministries have got their specific technologies on which they are working because the landscape is too huge. It, it cannot be, it can be a whole of nation approach, but it cannot be a specific to defense approach because there are spillover technologies which have to come in, which you yourself has brought out in terms of all the uh, different facets of uh, warfare and how it is going to embed in. So unless you have this technology strategy, you will not have people working on programs. You will not have programs which will be running through for 25 years as Gen Power has brought out already. You will not get the cadre or the human resource working with continuity for a program which is very much required. And if you do not do it now, if you do not put your pen to paper and come out with a national strategy, and down to the defense strategy and your defense HR, and you're working on these projects, you will be left out from the others because the data as a group is working on it. The countries are working on it. They are changing the complete equipment profile for the Czech Republic has completely washed away their uh, MBT fleet and coming on to a new generation fleet with all these uh, integrated systems and IoT systems, which is going to be the future warfare. The DAP requiring a change will have supplements coming in. The DAP has because you have got restructured your ordnance safety board. You are restructuring your DRDO. You will restructure. You have restructured your uh, technology development fund or your uh, defense innovations which are going in. So the entire thing has to undergo a sea change. For that, the technology strategy is critical. Until you do not come downwards, you cannot go as to what is the roadmap on which you have to progress. So those are my points. Baki, yes, very good point of clearization. But all this will come with money. The Infosys guy or the ECS guy or whoever you are sitting given a particular project. So they say that the DRDO is reorging. Uh, there's a reorg. It won't be DARPA, but it will be partly DARPA type of a methodology when you have projects on which these people will have to work. They'll have to be financially uh, remunerated to get onto the job. And they'll have to be time bound. That is the way it will work. And there'll be baby steps on uh, new technologies. And there will be, uh, with new technologies, you may not have technology insertion because the technology development cycles are coming down. They are truncating. So you may not have, you may have one time. But yes, you will have to have way of scaling up. You will have to have ways of integrating. You will have to have ways of joint membership coming in and joint structures coming in in terms of every landscape. Let it be a logistic, let it be a maintenance, let it be a life cycle sustenance. Uh, those are my views. Sir. Thank you. you now, Kiran Rudrapa can have, uh, you know, he has raised his hands. Okay. So thank you very much, sir. Extraordinary session. Thank you very much, Anil Kapoorji and team. Uh, my question is, uh, you know, um, when you are working on a you know, technology-based product and solution for a you know, military and uh, a company like us who have created an ecosystem for the product and uh, you know manufacturing in Bangalore. So one of the always you know concern is that uh, the projects coming under uh, NCNC. So where uh, projects of you know uh, uh, strategy critical one uh, personally we feel that one should not be in ncnc because in a startup or corporates to invest and develop and then prototype and get into the commercial uh, uh, you know engagement would be in a tds and then uh, very risky uh anil Kapur, do, you, do you see that when any change in the ncnc down the line yeah in fact if you see the present dap 2020 
uh, it allows you a little leeway if you are willing to come and see NC to give you up to a three year kind of a holiday for a three year um, handhold. But after three years, you have no handhold. Now, the problem you will face is that the three year requirement may, may not be enough for you to break even sometimes depending on the technology. So I think this is a good point. That you've given. In fact, this point we had taken up when we were doing DAP 2020 since I was also part of the committee uh, chairing some of the sessions uh, of DAP 2020. Uh, I think this is something which is very much required. But more importantly, see, today we have a huge ecosystem in terms of funding that is available uh, through various industries, uh, through venture capitalists and angel investors, and through government funded schemes, including TDF. I think since it's a long term engagement, maybe we can engage one on one. I'm not sure which technology you're talking of. But we can find a lot of solutions today that can be funded. Though the uh, you know the bosses will say NCNC because none of us has has those kind of responsibility you want because we have to go through a process. But I think there are other mechanisms which are available which can be recommended to you to be able to use them, give the NCNC flavor with somebody else's money if I miss it. Yes, sir. Thank you. Love to talk to you. In uh -huh. fact, you know, in uh, Indian context, uh, software and in AI products gets funded much more heavily than in a defense projects. Okay. And the awareness and the risk, uh, you know, uh, anticipated or a return invest, you know, expected by the investor is quite different. And then they're averse to the defense. Even though we see in a change, but still it's not in a conducive to, you know, invest in an NCNC type of projects by them. Thank you, Mr. Rudrappa. Uh, General Kapoor's uh, email and uh, even his mobile number is mentioned on the website on, on his bio data. So if you have any query, you can uh, get in touch with him. He's a very, very approachable and uh, available person. And uh, we mean to do a lot. And we, we really feel that if you have any point, if you can give a talk on the problems from the industry side, we will look forward to that. So sure. please consider you that much. if you Definitely. have, you please approach us and we will arrange, a, you can use our platform to represent the industry and give your points because these are very experienced people and some of the government uh, officials will also be there. We will definitely let your voice go to the, okay. is the right Thank point. You. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Brigadier Sandeep, sir, we are already running out of time. We have over, overshot the time. Please. Uh, uh, let us know. Uh, should we uh, have okay. more? Okay. I think uh, uh, we are. You know, I am. Um, uh, what remains is to thank everybody who had come here. Firstly, uh, and attended the thing and raised questions. And uh, no words to thank General Kapoor, uh, General Doctor Kapoor, who had given an excellent talk on uh, how we should take the industry uh, together with the armed forces and take the new technology as it comes uh, put into the uh, you know uh, put it into the defense uh, uh, for for better uh, results in the operations and today uh, it is going to be a time of technology war technological warfare rather than contact warfare it will be non contact warfare and contact warfare and the domains are as such all domains will be used for fighting a war against an adversary be it uh, whoever starts it first, whoever takes it later, uh, the gray zone warfare will be put into effect first and bring the country to a level wherein uh, the uh, the perpetrator of the gray zone warfare will be able to easily take control of the situation in that country and economically benefit out of that country. That's what is today's game. And we are already seeing it, uh, the technology, how the technology is being used in uh, the uh, uh, USSR uh, correction uh, the so uh, the Russian uh, uh, and uh, Ukraine war and also what's happening in Gaza Strip uh, between Israel and the Hamas. So thank you very much, sir, uh, for uh, enlightening all the people who are here, the industrialists who are going to be our backbone uh, when the uh, when we have to actually put into effect uh, what the disruptive technology and the latest technology which will bring in uh, better. Uh, uh, better results uh, when you carry out operations. Thank you very much for all those who attended. 
and thank you uh, thank you pavan uh, general pavan uh, and general khandare has already left uh, uh, thank you general pavan and the, all the other uh, uh, research assistants who had uh, attended from st jos they uh, left sir okay thanks thanks and uh, uh, we we'll look, for, we'll look forward to the next meeting the next webinar i'll request all to join and uh, we'll take it further forward mr kiran i am also in bangalore if any you know you can always contact me oh sure thank you very much okay uh, thank you uh, to all the participants from the iirf side and uh, with the next topic and the next speaker will be announced very soon and we will reach out the way we reached out to you this time and uh, we will see uh, consider if the recording can be made available to you uh, to those who uh, desire it or those who want it and this is a lecture series uh, so if you have any uh, point any uh, topics uh, which you think should be discussed on this platform please do also let us know uh, reach, reach us out thank you very much to everyone thank you general kapoor sir Uh, lovely very very educative very very informative i hope uh, our audience has uh, has uh, enough take away from it and indus international research foundation is a global think tank with its physical presence in india and usa it is a global network of scholars professionals and veterans based in various parts of the globe The foundation focuses primarily on international relations, Indian heritage, political economy and security studies. While the uniqueness of IIRF India lies in the fact that it seeks solution to national and international problems through the prisms of Indian ethos, philosophy and civilizational wisdom, IRF Americas is committed to act as a bridge between the people, academics, enterprise and businesses of the two democracies to join hands for a better world and a better tomorrow. It also tries to bring the people of two countries together. True to its motto, IIRF aims to provide forum to the voices from all quarters, geographies and gender who question dominant narratives. It is this plurality of thought, so unique to Indian tradition that IIRF seeks to carry abroad while simultaneously bringing contemporary global debates to India. If mankind is to survive as a civil society, There is no alternative other than to share the resources of the universe equitably for the benefit of all. I IRF believes in the Indian wisdom contained in Vedas that says, nature is the sole owner of all the treasure of this universe and there is enough for everyone.